And welcome to the second episode of this new program, The Signs of the Hour. If you recall, we discussed yesterday the importance of studying such a science. And we mentioned the importance of the belief in the day of resurrection, the belief in the day of judgment. And we stated that it is part of the six pillars of Iman. So a person who does not have it does not have any Iman. He's not considered to be a Muslim. Any person thinking that there is no day of judgment. It's just like the pagans used to think. It is wombs pushing out and earth swallowing in. And this is the cycle they think that life is all about. If a person thinks like this, he's not a Muslim. Even if he prays and fasts and does all the nine yards, he is not a Muslim because he lacks one of the pillars of Iman and hence he is not considered to be a Muslim. We mentioned yesterday some of the verses that state that there are signs of the Day of Judgment. And now we will move on to mention some of the ahadith which is the prophetic teachings the teachings of the prophet and messenger of islam muhammad peace be upon him sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wasallam and the majority of evidences are stemmed and derived from the sunnah it is far more than what is found in the Qur'an. And why is that? Because the Qur'an is a general book. It's the word of Allah Azza wa Jal. And it is not stated in detail. The details are mentioned in the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. Otherwise, if there was no need for the Prophet ﷺ to be around, then Allah would have just sent us the book, the Qur'an, and that would have sufficed. There was no need for a messenger to explain and to give us what and what not to do and to be our role model. But the Prophet ﷺ was sent and he was given another revelation other than the Quran, which is whatever comes from his mouth. Because he does not say anything out of his own whim. It is something that Allah Azza wa Jal inspires him and reveals to him to say. And if he says something out of his own ishtihad, if he makes something out of his own judgment and it, and it occurs to be wrong, Allah will correct him immediately. Therefore, whatever he had left is part of the religion. Without believing in the sunnah, a person is not a Muslim. Those who only abide by the Quran, so they claim. And they say we would not do anything except abiding by the Quran. They're not Muslim. If they don't believe in the Sunnah, if they reject the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, they're not Muslim. Because everything that we practice, 90% of it is in the Sunnah. And 10% it's, or 100% is mentioned in the Quran, but in general terms. The details you have to go and refer to the Sunnah. Now, as you remember, yesterday we've stated that the program is half an hour talking about the signs of the hour the signs of the Day of Judgment. And the second half is for your questions. It is recommended that you call at 3.30 local time, Mecca time, which is in about 24 minutes from now, to ask about the topic, which is the signs of the hour, or anything related to it, 
if I know the answer, I will answer you. If I don't know the answer, I will, uh, inshallah, postpone it till tomorrow. However, some of the brothers and sisters complained that yesterday's segment, the second half, we had only one question about the signs of the hour, and the rest of the questions were about fasting, prayer. Uh, um, it, it's like, ask Huda. And they're complaining, and they have the right to complain, but this is the format of the program. So the second half is for questions. Now, if I'm going to just sit here idle and do this and wait for you to call about the signs of the hour and you don't, this would be a waste of time, my time and your time. So if you have a question on the signs of the hour, this is a priority that should be given to you. But if there are no questions at the moment because we did not go into detail, and I believe that we will get a lot of questions later on, inshallah, if Allah prolongs our lives. And, and if we don't have any question at the moment, then the floor is open to any of your questions. And I pray to Allah that we benefit from this program and we learn from it. Now, going back to the importance of studying the signs of the hour. So many times we get people who are skeptical, meaning that, when you say, let's talk about the sign, signs of the hour, you'll find someone jumping and saying, this is not a great uh, topic to talk about. Why not talk about our brothers who are being oppressed in Syria and in Burma? Why don't you talk about jihad? I said, mm, <clears throat> good idea. Okay, so tomorrow I start to talk about jihad. You get another portion of people jumping and saying, Talking about jihad at this present time, this means you're from the Khawarij, you want to topple governments, you want to create violence and mayhem and chaos. Subhanallah. Okay, what do you want me to do? You should talk about the things that people are so much in need of, such as prayer, purity. People don't even know how to answer the call of nature and how to purify themselves and clean themselves. Okay, following day, I speak about purity, water, wudu, uh, 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 ghusl of janaba, menstruations. People come up and jump and say, this is all what you know, scholars of Saudi Arabia. Purity, menstruation, post-birth uh, uh, bleeding, that is all what you know. Talk about things that are more important, about transactions. Subhanallah. So following day, I talk about transactions uh, of banks and riba and uh, 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 credit cards, etc. The halal, the haram that involves in it. And you get people talking about problems in the house. Talk about social problems. Talk about marriages. Talk about disputes about, uh, between the spouses. At the end of the day, you will not be able to satisfy every single person. However, Studying the signs of the hour is extremely important. Someone will say, yeah, this is why you're doing it. Definitely, it has to be extremely important. But if someone else was doing it, maybe you would not think so. No, I, it is. And I'll give you the example from the Sunnah. The evidence that you, inshallah, will be convinced that studying this science is extremely important. To know of it is extremely important. The first hadith is the hadith of Umar ibn Khattab. May Allah be pleased with him. We all know this hadith. Umar says that we were once with the Prophet ﷺ when a man came in and he had black dark hair and very white clothes and he did not have any signs of traveling. You know, a traveler usually comes dusted and uh, his clothes are not clean or ironed properly. The guy was perfect in his appearance. And Umar says, and none of us knew him. So the man was a stranger. No one knew him in Medina. And Medina was small. Everybody knows everyone else. And he, it was not a traveler. Where did he come from? So the man came and he placed his knees opposite to the Prophet's knees, Islam, and put his hand on his thighs. So he was this close to the Prophet, Islam. And then he asked the Prophet the questions you know. He said, tell me about Islam. And the Prophet named the five pillars of Islam. Tell me about Iman. And the Prophet gave him the six pillars of Iman. Tell me about Ihsan. And the Prophet told him about Ihsan. And then the man told him, O Prophet of Allah, tell me about the hour. 
And the Prophet said, والسلام, the one who is being asked does not know more about it than the one who is asking. So the man did not stop here. He went further and said, then tell me about its signs. And the Prophet said, والسلام, the slave girl will give birth to her mistress and you will see the barefoot, naked, destitute herdsmen competing in constructing lofty buildings. And then the man went away. The Prophet ﷺ told the companions uh, and told Umar to be specific, go and fetch the man back. So immediately Umar went out, but the man has vanished. So the Prophet ﷺ told Umar, Umar, do you know who, was, who that man was? And Umar said, Allahu and his Prophet knows best. How would I know? And the Prophet told him ﷺ, it was Jibreel, the ark angel Gabriel he came to teach you your religion to teach all of you your religion in another narration the Prophet said every time Jibreel came I could recognize him except this time I didn't know who he was which means that the Prophet when answering these four questions or five Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did not know that Jibreel was the one who's asking and that is why he told the companions afterwards after Allah Azza wa informed him that this was Jibreel teaching you your religion okay so what's the point well the point is easy the hadith is about teaching us our religion and Jibreel asked three questions everyone knows by default everyone in the Prophet's court والسلام, know it. What is Islam? What is Iman? What is Ihsan? What probably they did not know was the signs of the hour. And that is why the Prophet said, والسلام, He came to teach you your religion. So your religion are these four things. Islam, Iman, Ihsan, and the signs of the hour. And this highlights, because it was combined with the three branches of Islam, the most three important three branches it highlights the importance of the signs of the hour otherwise he would have asked him about uh, uh, the ruling on transactions dealing with riba interest or the ruling on migrating to the non-muslims and living there or the ruling on this or that that was not the case he asked him about his these four questions so when the prophet said that the, uh, uh, the one who's being asked does not know more about it than the one who's asking then he asked him about its signs, which illustrates how important this is. This should be enough for us to know the importance of studying this, the signs of the hour. In the, in the authentic hadith, in the Sahih, Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman. And who is Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman? Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman, may Allah be pleased with him and with his father, was one of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ who migrated at the second year of Hijrah. And when they were about to enter Medina, they were abducted by the pagans. And they asked him, what do you want? Do you want to become Muslim? you want to go to Muhammad? And they said, no, 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 we just want to go to Medina. And they said, you're not going to fight with Muhammad? He said, no, no. And they gave them their oath and pledges and promises that they will not. Once they went in, the Prophet was prepared والسلام, to go to Badr in the second year of Hijrah. So Hudayfa told the Prophet والسلام, about their pledges and about their promises to the pagans. The Prophet did not tell them, they are pagans, to hell with them, break your promise. The Prophet والسلام, said, fulfill your promise and we will ask, we will ask Allah's uh, 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 support and we will depend and rely only on Allah against the pagans. Look at the beauty of Islam. Fulfill your promise to the pagans who are about to fight the Muslims. Why? Because our religion is built and based on trust, on fulfilling your promise. And those who claim to be Muslims and they're lying and cheating, they don't relate to Islam. We don't bear the consequences of their wrong actions. They will, on the Day of Judgment, be accountable for that. And that is why we're studying the Day of Judgment so that you do not cheat, you do not lie, you do not do things that would tarnish the reputation of Islam. The hell with your reputation with all due respect. It is the reputation of Islam that we are protecting 
and we're fulfilling our duties to Allah Azza wa Jal. So Hudayf ibn al-Yaman went with the Prophet ﷺ the following year to the Battle of Uhud, his, him, him and his father. His father was killed by friendly fire in the chaos, in the midst of uh, uncertainty when everything was so mixed and people thought that the Prophet died, ﷺ was killed in the Battle of Uhud. So the Muslims started killing whoever they see in a battleground, of course. huh? They were not in a city. They were in the battleground fighting an army. And by mistake, because the people were in armor, they killed Hudayfa's father, Al-Yaman. And he was shouting, my father, my father, and they did not listen because they were unaware of what was happening. And he died. And the Prophet ﷺ wanted to give Hudayfa blood money. And Hudayfa said, no, this was a mistake from my brothers. May Allah forgive them. And he did not take the money and this got him much much closer in the eyes of the prophet he's a man of honor hudayf ibn al-yaman may allah be pleased with him was known to have known the names of the hypocrites the hypocrites pretend to be muslims they pray like us they fast like us but they are undermining islam and they are plotting to destroy it we have a lot of hypocrites nowadays in the arab world in the muslim world there are so many of them. Some know that they're hypocrites and they are in the uh, uh, hellfire forever with the kuffar. Some don't know, but their actions, unfortunately, uh, are the actions of kuffar. So Hudayfa was with the Prophet a lot of the time, والسلام, and the Prophet told him about the names of the hypocrites. And the Prophet والسلام, was open in the sense that a person says that I'm a Muslim and he behaves like a Muslim, Allah reveals to him that this is a kafir. He's a hypocrite. He's not a Muslim. But the Prophet does not want Ali Sussam to jump to the gun and execute his companions without any evidence. Then they would say that Muhammad is killing his companions. So the Prophet Ali Sussam would only judge people on what appears uh, over them, on their actions, not on what is in their hearts, because this is only known by revelation. And the Prophet ﷺ wanted to give the lesson to his ummah. Do not judge intentions. Do not judge people's hearts. Because this is only uh, uh, something that Allah knows about. You and I are supposed to judge people by their actions. So if I see someone going to a graveyard, going to a tomb of a wali or of a pious person, or even to the Prophet ﷺ, and starts to prostrate to it, and sacrifices to it and hangs candles next to it and gives money to uh, uh, the custodians of the, such a shrine and he supplicates to the deceased to the dead oh bring me good oh prevent me from harm we do not judge his intention we say this guy is a kafir his actions state that he's a kafir otherwise if i see someone stepping on the Quran or trying to burn it or trying to humiliate the Prophet Islam, I would say, mm, let me look into his intention. I don't have to. This is a clearly blunt evidence that he is a kafir. With the hypocrites, it's a different issue. The Prophet told us, Islam, do not judge intentions. Judge actions. Intentions are for Allah, the Almighty Subhanahu wa Ta'ala. That verily deeds are by their intentions. This is something I cannot judge. So Hudayfa was with the Prophet ﷺ once at the Battle of Tabuk when some of the hypocrites, I, I, if, I'm, if I'm not mistaken, uh, it's the, the Battle of Tabuk on the ninth year of Hijrah, when some of the hypocrites tried to assassinate the Prophet ﷺ. And he was with Hudayfa and the Prophet saw them and he shouted at them and subhanAllah, they were 12 or so and they were terrified and they ran away. 12 of them, only in front or against two unarmed men, yet it is Allah Azza wa Jal that threw the awe and fear in their hearts and they fled and ran away. Hudayfa knew them one by one. Not only that, the Prophet also informed him that this man is a hypocrite, this man is a hypocrite, by name. But he would not reveal that to anyone. And that is why Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, whenever he wanted to appoint one of his rulers in a district or so, he used to go to uh, Hudayfa and he would ask, is he among the hypocrites? And Hudayfa would not say. If he's not, he, say, he would say no. 
But if he is, he would refrain from answering. And people, the companions knew that he was the one to know, and they used to call him Sahib al-Sir, the, the, the owner of the secret of the Prophet because he informed him about the hypocrites. Why is this long story related to the signs of the hour? I'll tell you. Hudayfa, beside knowing the names of the hypocrites, he also knew the signs of the hour more than anyone else. Why is that? Well, simply because he used to ask the Prophet ﷺ in an authentic hadith, in a sahih. He asked the Prophet ﷺ, he said about himself, everyone used to ask the Prophet ﷺ about good deeds, about good things, except me. I used to ask him about evil things, fearing that I would fall into it. And the Prophet ﷺ, and you find a lot of the hadiths about tribulations and calamities, mentioned or the narrator was Hudayfa. For example, Hudayfa says, may Allah be pleased with him, that the Prophet ﷺ once preached us and gave us a sermon. And in that sermon, he did not leave a single thing that will take place from now till the day of judgment, except he told us about it. He did not leave a thing. Now, logically, one would think, Akhi, this would take like a few years at least. Well, no. The things that the Prophet told them about were the signs of the hour. They were about the tribulation that will, the, the Muslim Ummah will face in the future. Great tribulations such as the Antichrist, such as the uh, 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 Ma'juj. And we will talk about this, inshallah, if Allah prolongs in our lives. And he told them about everything. And he said that I memorized it all. And so did my companions. But some of them, or most of them, forgot what they heard on that day. And I forgot few. And subhanAllah, whenever I see it happening in front of me, I remember that the Prophet told us about it. As if you forget someone's uh, name, but when you see his face, you remember that. Not only that, also in the Sahih, Amr ibn Akhtab, may Allah be pleased with him. He tells us that the Prophet والسلام, and listen to this carefully, prayed Fajr prayer. So this is in the beginning of the morning. And then he went to the pulpit and gave us a speech, a sermon, until it was Dhuhr prayer. And he came down and prayed. And then went back and gave us a sermon until it was Asr prayer. And then he prayed. And then he went back and gave us a sermon until it was Maghrib time. And then he prayed. And he said that he told us about everything that's going to take place from now till the day of judgment. And the most knowledgeable of us all is the one who memorized what he had said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So this hadith clearly indicates that the Prophet took a full day off just to talk to the companions about the tribulations, about the calamities, and about the signs of the hour that will come. A full day lecture from Fajr till Maghrib. So minimum, it's, if, if you're in the UK and it's winter, minimum it's like eight hours or seven hours. But if it's in summer, and in you, you are in, in the Scandinavian or whatever, uh, the, longest so, the day is so long, it can reach up to 20 hours. It can reach up to 18 hours. Yeah, he say it's 10 hours. Imagine what would the Prophet use, tell them, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We have five minutes before we uh, open the lines for your questions. A third hadith, highlighting the importance of the signs of the hour. Hudayfa, again, may Allah be pleased with him, told us that the Prophet, alayhi salatu was was counting the tribulations that will happen to his ummah. And among them, he said that there are three tribulations that do not leave a thing, meaning that it, 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 it is so harmful, it is so strong that it would not leave anyone without touching or uh, uh, affecting him. And he spoke about, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, um, tribulations that are like the wind of summer. And he spoke about tribulations that were small, tribulations that were big, and everyone was in that gathering with the Prophet who heard it, is gone and only I remain. Umar bin Khattab, 
the second caliph, he also used to ask about these signs and about the tribulations that the Prophet had taught them about Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. For example, in an authentic hadith, he was with his people and he asked them a question. And he said, who among you heard the hadith regarding fitna? And fitna can mean calamity, can mean test, and can mean a tribulation. So Hudayfa said, I heard it, and I know it as the Prophet has said it. So Umar said, MashaAllah, you're brave. You are coming forward, and you have no fear of talking about the Prophet's uh, uh, hadith, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So Hudayfa said, yes, the Prophet told us about the fitna, the test, the calamity. One would have in himself, in his children, in his wife, in his neighbor, in his wealth, everything that's connected with an individual. And he told us that the kafara, the expiation, that would remove the, any sins occurred through this is that a person's prayer, fasting, charity, and enforcing uh, uh, virtue and preventing vice. So Umar said, said, no, 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 this is not the fitna I was asking about. I'm asking about the fitna that is in waves like a tidal wave. It is like a tidal wave and it's so huge that it is beyond imagination. Look at the knowledge that Hudayfa had. Hudayfa said, don't worry about that fitna you are afraid of because between you, Umar, and this fitna, there's a big door. So Umar asked, will this door be opened or will it be broken? And Hudayfa said, no, it will be broken. Then Umar regretfully said, if it's broken, it will never be closed. Meaning that this would mark the beginning of all kinds of different tribulations and calamities and catastrophes for the Ummah of Islam. So the companions of Hudayfa asked him, and they said, what puzzles are you guys talking about? Door breaking, opening? calamities, tribulations. Didn't Umar know what the door was? And Hudayfa said, yes. He knew what the door was as he knew that tomorrow comes after today. The door was Umar. So Umar knew that he would be assassinated and his assassination would open all doors for different types of tribulation. And this happened after his death. We had the, the assassination of Uthman then we had the assassination of Ali. Then we had, before that, the, the battle between the two huge Muslim uh, armies led by Ali and Muawiyah. May Allah be pleased with them both. And then we have Safin. We have uh, the, the camels battle. Then we have the Khawarij who came to fight uh, Ali and the tribulation they did. Then we had the Mu'tazila. Then we had different kind of tribulations. All started after the, the assassination of Umar, may Allah be pleased with him. And to study this science, the signs of the hour, this increases your Iman. This makes a lot of what you're going through clearer when you look at things and analyze by only studying the signs of the hour. For example, when we see Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa, when we see Bayt Al-Maqdis, when we see Jerusalem, the blessed land, in the hands of the filthy Jews, the impure Kafir Jews, and we have 1.6 billion Muslims unable to do a thing. If you have, we have a saying, if you have five Muslims, you would get six opinions one just for the road. They are not united. So when we see what is happening in Palestine, and I pray to Allah Azza wa that Allah liberates it from the hands of the filthy Jews and those who uh, 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 assist them and provide for them weaponry and provide for them the logistics, the enemies of Allah Azza wa When we see what's happening there, we feel depressed and we feel down. But when we see the signs of the hours and when we know for sure and for certain, it's certain, it's beyond doubt that Jesus will kill the Dajjal in Jerusalem. 
and we know this for certain we feel comfortable that the land is ours and Allah will give this land to us to the Muslims and it will Allah will liberate it and everything will spring out from this uh, uh, blessed uh, country this blessed land and then we will see the major signs cascading as we will come to mention inshallah likewise when we have the hadith where the prophet tells us that those eating will collapse on the muslim ummah the, the non-muslims will collapse on the muslim ummah as those who eat go to the plate to eat from it so when they're hungry they all come and collapse to eat from a dish or from a big plate the non-muslims will collapse on the muslim ummah likewise this is the hadith of prophet, prophet and this is exactly what's happening muslims are worthless they have no power they have no opinion no one listens to them why because the prophet told us in the hadith when the companions say why would the whole world collapse on us is it because we're few the prophet said no you are a lot but you are like the foam of a flood the foam that comes on top has it's worthless nobody would pay a penny penny to 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 buy it and allah azza wa jal would throw the fear of death in your heart and Allah will throw al-wahan in your hearts and so they ask what is wahan what is this weakness the Prophet said the love of this dunya loving to live thinking that you're not gonna die so you work and live for this world as we mentioned yesterday about those who do not believe in the day of judgment Muslims are like this some of them they live and die for this world not thinking of the hereafter and Allah Azza wa Jal would make you worthless in the eyes of your enemies. And finally, before we go to the break, the Prophet also والسلام, told us that, and it's part of the glad tidings, when we see this oppression in the Muslim world, when we look at countries and we see the goods and the fortunes of these countries are embezzled and are being extracted by a few filthy leaders who oppress their people and who take the goods of the land and never return anything back to them they look as if they're living in primitive uh, 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 cities and, and villages and when we see this injustice taking place and we, we see this uh, 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 type and sort of oppression and aggression we feel depressed but when we study the signs of the hour we know that there will come a dawn after this dark night and there is a light at the end of the tunnel the prophet told us والسلام, that when the mahdi comes he will come at a time of extreme oppression and injustice and allah Azza wa Jalla will fill the whole earth with al mahdi but uh, 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 he will fill the whole earth with fairness and justice now this does not mean we sit back and relax waiting for the mahdi and saying well i'm not going to change anything no that when the Mahdi comes, there will be lots and lots of other pious and righteous people paving the way for him by forcing justice, by trying to implement the Sharia ah in all aspects of life. So when he comes, he will find this uh, uh, paid for him. And Allah Azza wa knows best. We have a short break and then we will either take your calls if there are calls or we will continue to go on with uh, the uh, program so stay tuned and there is an American sister who is very active in Dawah in Egypt told me personally that uh, she traveled between Buddhism and Christianity and different sects and when she came to read the Quran she started by reading from right to left Surah Al-Fatiha. She said, I swear, once I finished it, I fainted. I could not believe myself that there is such book that people were so negligent and ignorant about. 
this is ha that has to be the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and she said I accepted Islam simply after reading Surah Al-Fatiha and knowing the first chapter it's seven verses seven verses Allah, Allah, Allah. the Arabic itself which is the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke the Quran hmm. so this is by itself is a medicine it is a word of it's Allah. a word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it goes into the heart it was not created rather Allah spoke it out Ramadan nights be blessed with welfare and forgiveness Ramadan Ramadan, Ramadan. You can't do that because you do not know what to say to them something. At least you raise up your hand and ask Allah, Oh Allah, please give guidance to this brother of mine. The importance of following Prophet Muhammad Wasallam. To follow our Prophet Wasallam means you must understand his sunnah. Adinu Yusra, Islam is a very easy religion, simple religion. So don't make religion difficult to yourself. I believe this hadith is very common to all of us. But the beauty part of this hadith, number one, it started by Omar al-Qadam saying, Sami'tu. Now again, I'd like to share with the brother and sister to understand the beauty of this saying of the companion. Oh Allah, fulfill our aims in life. Assalamu and welcome back. So until we get um, your calls and, and, and phone calls, we will continue to go through some of the things that are related to these signs of the hour. The scholars divide the signs of the hour into two types minor and there are so many of them and major and they say that it's only 10 signs that are major why do they call it minor signs of the hour they say because there are so many and they take a lot of time to take place in so some of them happened and will never happen again some of the minor signs happened, but there's nothing to prevent it from reoccurring somewhere down the line. And some of them are continuously happening. So these are the minor signs. The major signs, they were mentioned in a hadith, and they considered it to be major because they are unlike anything that men had experienced before. Not only that, they are taking place in a very short period of time, which means that they are like a necklace. Uh, we have Sister Asia. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakallah khair for the nice program. I really appreciate, uh, but along with the question and answer, we are getting the information uh, which is very important. So uh, side by side we can ask the question also and we, uh, we can get that information also. Jazakallah khair. One question, people always say, uh, they always discuss, this is the sign of uh, akhirah, this is going, this is happening, this is happening. All this discussion are going on. But when we try to tell them, we, we, we will let us do some action. They, they go behind and they say, what can we do? It is already mentioned. There are going to come 73 sex. It is already mentioned. What we will do it? Like this, they keep on argument. How to handle such people? Jazakallah khair. Well, jazaki, jazakallah khair. Sister Asya is asking a very, very good question. And that is, there are people who are not ready to act. They're not ready to do something. So when they see things they first of all are wrong in interpreting these things to the signs of our this is not for me and you saying that okay if we see something if there's a battle in Iraq for example when the, the American invasion took place in Iraq people started extracting authentic 
weak and even fabricated hadiths saying that oh this was mentioned in the sunnah the prophet spoke about the sufiani and saddam hussein is the, the sufiani so we should back him up and the the, the 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 invading troops are this and that and there will come and this will happen and all of this is baseless you do not have the right to say that this is or this is not the sign of the hour because a number of scholars have to study it thoroughly and make sure that this is the sign of, uh, of the hour as in the, uh, the case of the fire that came out in Medina which we will come to discuss later on inshallah and the Prophet told us that from this fire 2,000 miles away in Iraq or in, uh, in so that is in, in Busra in Sham about 1,500 miles away uh, kilos uh, kilometers away that from this fire in Medina it will be lighting you, you will see the light of the necks of the camels 1500 kilometers away so the scholars of all the time who were there which this event took place in 654 654 Hijri and it was reported in all books of, of, of history and the people there reported it and documented it they agreed that this is what the Prophet said it was obvious but we do not have the right to whenever we see something or hear something say, oh this is part of the uh, uh, signs of the hour the Prophet said so and so without verifying it with the scholars and authenticating this is number one this is number one number two is that these people even if they know that the Antichrist is coming Jesus is coming tribulations are coming they tend to relax and say, Khalas, I cannot do anything. Akhi, do something, make a difference. Say, no, no, why should I tell people that this is wrong and this is right? It's no, no use. Khalas, it's all been uh, through with. And I will not change a thing. And things will deteriorate. These people are accountable at the side of Allah. Allah told you that these things will happen. And Allah told you at the same time to work and act upon it. So you have to work. If someone says, Akhi, I'm going to die in like, 70 years from now so why should I pray why should I fast if you don't you go to hell but if you do then alhamdulillah if you abuse yourself and consume something that is haram that's harmful to your body thinking that well it's already been recorded and I'm gonna die at a certain age I don't know which age so no matter what I do I'm gonna die so I'm gonna take uh, uh, drugs and I'm gonna uh, drink intoxicants and I'm gonna smoke and and you harm your body you are killing yourself so you are right, Sister Asya. You should act and do what you have to do as instructed in the Quran and Sunnah. We have uh, uh, Abdullah, Om Abdul Rahman. Salam alaikum. Salam Apologies for keeping you waiting. Uh, it's, uh, it's okay. Uh, this is. Uh, I just can we throw some more light on uh, Imam Mahdi? Okay. Oh, Imam Mahdi and also uh, what is the reason uh, repeat of this program so that I can watch it even later on. Okay, inshallah. Uh, Sister Asma. Sister Asma. Wa alaikum wa How are you? I'm fine, alhamdulillah. Zakallah khair. How can I help you? Yeah, what I want to ask you about the zakat. If my husband wants to give the zakat to his brother, is it fine? Uh, his brother has a family. Does his brother have a family? Yeah, his brother is having family. And he's poor and needy? Yeah, of course. Okay, I will answer the question, inshallah. Sister Faiza from Emirates. Hello, alaikum. Um, my name is Faiza. I'm South African and I live in the UAE. Listen to me from the phone, please. Um, I would like to know I don't have a mahram here in Dubai. And I would like to know if it is possible for me to go for Umrah without a mahram. I'm 45 years old. Okay. I will answer your question, inshallah. Okay, uh, uh, Sister Um Abdul Rahman was asking that can we shed more light on the Mahdi? The answer is no. The, we, we're going into a sequence, but I'll give you 
some highlight so that you would not mistaken anyone coming tomorrow i may come on the tv channel say i am the mahdi hallelujah prove it first of all the prophet has not told us he would be called muhammad like the prophet's name and his father his name is like the prophet's name abdullah so the mahdi must be muhammad ibn abdullah this is his name so if someone comes to me tomorrow and says listen i'm the mahdi i'm a i have a very long beard and very short clothes and maybe I have something on my forehead to prove that I've been prostrating for ages and hours and my name is Abdurrahman Ibn uh, uh, Ahmed. So I say, tough luck, no cigars. Why? Because the Prophet told us you have to be Muhammad Ibn Abdullah. If someone comes to me and says, my name is Muhammad Ibn Abdullah Al-Qahtani. I said, tough luck. Why? Because this tribe honorable tribe of Qahtan is not related to the Prophet and the Prophet said he is from my descendant so he has to be the son or originally in, in, in his uh, uh, family tree he has to reach to Al Hassan or to Al Hussein reaching to the Prophet the Prophet said that he would not be practicing and overnight Allah Azzawajal would turn him into a practicing and pious and God fearing not only that that he would fill the earth which means that he would have control that he would have leadership he would fill the earth with fairness and justice so if someone comes and he's killed or he's imprisoned and he does not have these conditions he is not the Mahdi so is it wise that we sit back and relax and say I'll wait for the Mahdi and when he comes, I'll fight with him. No. Allah knows when he will come. But we know that he will come definitely at the end of the time because there will be a severe and grave and serious battle between the Muslims and the Christians. This is history. This, not, is, this is Sunnah. This is our religion. We believe in that. And this we will come, inshallah, to talk later on when we uh, talk about the great battles. And there will come a time when the Antichrist will the, uh, 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 show up and he will show up at the time of Mahdi and Jesus Christ will descend from the heavens when the Fajr time is called and Mahdi is about to lead the prayer when he sees Jesus he retreats and Jesus says no it was established for you and you should lead so he prays as an Imam and Jesus prays behind him so all of this happens at the very end of time so don't sit back and relax Work hard because your day of judgment takes place when you die. As for uh, the reruns, wallahi, I'm not sure, but if I'm not mistaken, they have reruns at 7 a.m. Uh, local time, Saudi time. Nowadays, it's uh, like two hours earlier in uh, GMT. So uh, Saudi time, it's after Fajr at 7 a.m. and Allah knows best. Uh, Sister Asma is asking about the ruling on giving the zakat. Okay, we have Ghulam. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Wa alaikum assalam, to Allah wa barakatuh. First of all, I would like to congratulate Ghulam for all these wonderful programs. Those are helping we Muslims. Alhamdulillah, exactly. And, uh, and another thing is that. I have been watching Huda for the last seven years. Masha I have been in Saudi seven years and the day you have started this Huda, I am watching this. Masha Allah. And I like all the programs. And, and especially my Iman has grown stronger. Masha because Allah. what you want to say, that is logical. It is not like other channels, they bring their own uh, innovations. Alhamdulillah. That is a big thing. That is logic. Straight away, it fits your brain. Alhamdulillah. That is the best thing I like about Huda. Zakat the best and the perfect thing. Zakat uh, now my question, Sheikh, is that about this uh, Witter. I heard you uh, before, uh, because I was watching always your program. We, 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 I am basically from Kashmir, India. Okay. So in Witter, we uh, pray three rakats together. Okay. Uh, so uh, I want your clarification about that, uh, how to pray the Witter. Uh, that is important. Another thing is that in Maghrib, uh, here in Saudi Arabia, uh, we make Maghrib, uh, after that uh, we make uh, Azan, after that we make for, uh, wait for 10 or 15 minutes, and after that we make the uh, uh, Salah. Okay. But in Kashmir, they say no, uh, after Maghrib, uh, Azan, Khalas, Alatur, we have to make the Salah. 
So I want to know the uh, exact uh, this uh, what is the uh, exact uh, this uh, on this ruling on this. And I like your program, sir. And your uh, these plays are very nice and uh, perfect. Thank you, sir. God bless you. God bless you, sir. Thank you, you too. Jazak Allah khair. May Allah make you steadfast on iman, increase your iman through Huda uh, or through other means, inshallah. Sister Jasra from the AEU, I think she is gone. I apologize, but uh, the question took a little bit uh, too long. Uh, Sister Asma is asking about giving the zakat to your brother. Is this permissible? This is sometimes mandatory. Should I give my zakat to a stranger, to my brother? If I give it to my brother who's needy, he has to be needy. A lot of the Muslims give their zakat to their siblings, to their relatives, not because they're needy and poor and deserving to have zakat, but so that they would have an upper hand. They're telling me two minutes for conclusion, and, and I don't know why. Anyhow, I, I will not uh, care about that. So you may and should give your zakat to your brother when he's needy. If he's classified as needy or poor, you give him the zakat, and you have two rewards for that. Faiza says that she is from South Africa, and she is 45 years of age, and she wants to go to Umrah without a mahram. Is this permissible? That says no. The Prophet is the one who gave you the fatwa. The Prophet said that some, it is not permissible for a woman that believes in Allah and the Day of Judgment. And we are in the size of the Day of Judgment or the hour. It is not permissible for her to travel without a mahram. So Umrah and Hajj are not obligatory upon you, and you may not travel for Umrah without a mahram. Allah will reward you as long as you have this yearning to uh, uh, go for Umrah and you know that it is not permissible, Allah will give you the reward, inshallah, in full. Uh, Ghulam is asking about Witr. He's from Kashmir and he, they pray Witr three rak'ahs. So is this permissible? The answer is, the Prophet forbade us, alayhi wasallam, from praying Witr exactly as we pray Maghrib. So you can pray three rak'ahs Witr, providing you do not sit on uh, in the second rak'ah, so that you would not make it like Maghrib. You pray the first and stand up. You pray the second and you stand up and you pray the third and you sit for tashahud. So this is the sunnah. Or you split them into two and offer salam and then pr pray one individual rak'ah. Also this is the sunnah. Now, one would say, if I go to a masjid and the imam is praying witr exactly as maghrib, what should I do? The answer is, go with the imam, pray with him and do exactly as he does while knowing that this is not the sunnah. Why? Because the Imam is following a very respected and authentic school of thought, which is the school of thought of Abu Hanifa, may Allah have mercy on his soul. So this is his conviction. You follow him as his, your Imam. If it's wrong, then it's up to him. But this is his conviction. And by following it, you uh, follow the Sunnah. The last question before we conclude was about what's being practiced in Saudi Arabia. He says that the Adhan of Maghrib is called, and there's a time approximately 15 minutes between the adhan and the prayer while in kashmir they make the adhan and they immediately make the prayer afterwards and they go back home to break their fast so which is the best i believe what's being done in in kashmir is the best because what is happening is that people between maghrib adhan and, and the iqama they sit home for 15 minutes and eat and fill it up to the rim with brim and this is wrong and they go to you know, uh, they're Maghrib like Humpty Dumpty, walking, you hear the liquids and the food in their stomachs, and they're postponing and delaying the Maghrib without any legitimate reason. They should establish the prayer as usual. If you want to break your fast with dates and water and go, this is the right thing to do and not to delay it. This is all the time we have. Until we meet you next time. Fi amanillah, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. O oh my Creator, O oh Allah, fulfill our aims in life, Allah. Forgive our sins, Ya yeah, Allah, O oh Allah, the most gracious. O oh Allah, the most gracious, Ya Wasiyan Karami. O oh my Creator, O oh Allah, fulfill our aims in life, Allah. Forgive our sins, Ya yeah, Allah, O oh Allah, the most gracious.
Gracious, Yawasiyan Karami.